It's Wednesday, June 17th. We're studying 2 Peter. We're in 2 Peter chapter 3. We've reached verse number 16 as we continue our study through this passage, which reminds us that we are all to be waiting for the consummation of the ages when Christ is going to come back, set up a kingdom. There's going to be judgment for the lost. And so we need to be seeking to be holy without spot or blemish. Uh, and it says to be at peace with God. That's our goal. And we want to count the patience of our Lord, as we saw yesterday, as salvation. That's just a principle that we see throughout the scripture. And then it spoke of this topic that we're picking up on today, that as our beloved brother Paul wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, and we said that was a kind of wisdom that's more than just insight or discernment. This is the wisdom of the revelatory work that was done by the apostles. And so it continues the sentence here, and here's our verse for the day, verse 16. As he, that is Paul, does in all of his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. These are some things in them, there are some things rather in them, that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable, they twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So we've got to be careful that we understand the scriptures are right. But what's amazing in this passage is that Paul himself is being uh, hailed as one writing letters that you can see here are in the canon or in the measure of the rest of Scripture. They measure up to what is recognized by God's people as revelatory passages of Scripture, and these letters are canonicals, we would say. They're God-breathed, and so this is an amazing thing uh, to have us recognize from a passage like this. But let's just talk for just a second about the letters of Paul, as he does in all of his letters. Now, I told you that we have this letter that Peter is writing, we looked at their connection last time, in 67, AD 67, and I just wanted to say, well, let's think through the chronology of the New Testament. And it may surprise you, looking at this chart real quick, that we have most of our letters uh, preceding 2 Peter. I say 2 Peter, uh, my estimate here is 67, AD 67, that's the book that we are studying. There's only a few that follow, actually, toward the mid-90s here in the book of Revelation. Uh, 45, of course, James is above this, and there's some debate about the date of James, but I believe that uh, comes early. And then all of these here on this side, these are the epistles of Paul, the early epistles, the major epistles, what we call the prison epistles, and then the pastoral epistles. And if you look at the dates on these, you've got so many letters, right, that precede the writing of the book of 2 Peter. Matter of fact, all of our canonical letters precede Peter and what Peter has written, and we understand these letters to be the letters in view when... Peter says in these letters. And if you think about some of the early letters, which certainly Paul had, or that Peter rather, had access to, the early Pauline letters, now we understand the kinds of connection that he's making when it says, as he does in all his letters. Well, what kinds of things does he say? Well, he speaks of these matters. Well, the matters we've been dealing with, uh, we could see a lot if we go all the way back to chapter 2. We could go see a lot of connections if we go back to chapter 1. But the most immediate contextual topics have to do with the end of the world and what God is going to bring uh, on the world at the end of time and the day of the Lord. And it's coming and it's not going to delay even though it's not as soon as we think. God is not slow in keeping his promises. Well, here Here's just an example. We could look at many, but here's one example from one of his early letters. Paul writes this from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to be reading in verse number 1. Now concerning the times and seasons, right? these two words are the words that Jesus used in the original languages, kairos and chronos, chronos and kairos in this case. Brothers, you have no need uh, to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord, that's the phrase that we've been dealing with in 2 Peter, will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. That's been the theme, which really was the extension of the thought of destruction on the false teachers in chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2. But you're not in darkness. He's informed them of these things, brothers, that the day should surprise you like a thief. Well, you're always expecting the thief, then he's not going to surprise you, even though you don't know when he's coming. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. And he goes on to develop that idea. But the idea of the thief in the night or the day of the Lord, or the fact that he's coming, he's not going to delay, that there's going to be judgment, speaking here on the world like labor pains upon a pregnant woman. These are the these matters of 2 Peter chapter 3. At least it's one example of them. Look more in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 when it speaks of the coming judgment of God. And I've quoted this passage in the series already because it's such a great natural complement to what we see in 2 Peter. And it precedes it, of course, in time in the writing. But here you see Paul say the same kinds of thing. This is evidence that this 
demonstrative pronoun right here is pointing back earlier in the paragraph, the opening paragraph of 2 Thessalonians to the suffering that they're enduring. And he says, yeah, that suffering is a sign. It's evidence of the righteous judgment of God. And it seems out of order or anachronistic, we would say, but in reality, it's a evidence of it because the promise is he's going to judge those people that persecute them and the people that bring them such harm in this life. And I say them, us, Christians, uh, in the first century, they are going to be judged. That you may be considered, that is the other side of it, worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. And the affliction in the book of Second Peter started with, in chapter 2, the false teachers, the people that lead them astray, that are all about themselves, kind of the prosperity preachers of the first century. And then we have in chapter 3, of course, the mockers and the scoffers that are making fun of Christianity and deriding the Christians for believing in the promise of the return of Christ. And it was much more than that, as Paul talked about, even in coming to Thessalonica. He says, and what he's going to do is grant relief to you who are afflicted, which was a huge theme in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. And to us as well, Paul includes himself in that, for the Lord for when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, there's the, the topic of chapter 3 of Second Peter, with his mighty angels, now here's the theme we've been seeing, in flaming fire, what's he going to do? Well, he's going to inflict vengeance on those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there are those that don't know God, as it's often put in the scripture. They don't know God. Look at that in verse number 8. But it's also those who do, not obey, who do not obey the gospel. A lot of people have exposure to the gospel. But the point is, like the false teachers, they ignore that and they go back to some kind of lifestyle that reflects their old ways. And it also allows them in their teaching to wrangle the people that are not well grounded into believing what they're teaching. And they become the false teachers in complete opposition to the gospel that Jesus has given the church. So Paul spoke of those matters. Now, he says that, are, that there are some things in them, in those letters that Paul writes, that are hard to understand. If you've ever spent time studying all those epistles of Paul, you understand some things are very plain and, and the, the, the clarity is, is undeniable. And there's other things that are difficult. <clears throat> and given that what we see in the context of 2 Peter chapter 3, I'm going to say the things that probably Peter had in mind had to do, not that it doesn't apply to everything that Paul wrote, but it has to do with the things that have to do with the end times that people twist and distort. And so I thought in looking at some of Paul's letters and sticking with the earliest, which we knew that Peter would have exposure to, I thought it was worth us seeing some of the ways that uh, I'm sure there was confusion in the minds of people because of what Paul had taught, which was new revelatory information, the wisdom that God gave as an apostle, as a prophet, bringing this new information as he does in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to talk about new things that weren't revealed in the Old Testament about the coming eschaton or the things that are going to happen in the end. That's what eschaton means, the end of time. And he tells them this mystery that formally uncovered truths. Well, when he speaks about the coming of the Lord, that day of the Lord that we've been talking about in 2 Peter, now look at these concepts here from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now concerning the coming of the Lord, Jesus Christ, and our being gathered together with him. Well, just think of that one verse there in John 14 that we looked at, being caught up together with the Lord, that idea of being gathered together. I mean, that's a new concept as opposed to Christ coming back and setting his feet, as Zachariah says, on the Mount of Olives and him coming and delivering his people. What's this about being caught up or gathered together? He says, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a, or a spoken word or a letter, quote unquote, seeming to have been from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Okay, we already see that Paul is responding in 2 Thessalonians 2 to confusion among the Thessalonians about what he had taught. Let no one deceive you in any way. There's people that are unstable, they're ignorant, and they're twisting the passages and the teaching that the Apostle Paul brought. And then he starts to say, well, that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. This whole tribulational period that had been talked about, that Paul had spoken of, that, of course, John was later going to reveal in detail, that's got to be a part of this. If you missed the whole thing, that would have happened, and you would have seen this man of lawlessness or this beast that is described, this man of destruction, this one that is the Antichrist, as John said. Well, he's going to be revealed during that time. So if you haven't seen him and you haven't seen this major rebellion, well, then it hasn't happened. This son of destruction hasn't been revealed and therefore you didn't miss it. 
the one who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or ob object of worship, and he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. This is the abomination of desolation that was discussed in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. It's the same thing talked about in the book of Daniel. It was not fulfilled, at least not in its entirety, with Antiochus Epiphanes in the intertestamental period that uh, Judas Maccabeus and the rest of the Maccabean revolt revolted against and recapturing the temple. This has to do with something yet to come. Jesus said, when you see it, it's going to come down the road. And as Paul speaks of these things, and I'll tell you, the Olivet Discourse or all the discussion about the coming of Christ in Jesus' teaching, man, that's filled with confusion because the issue of being gathered together and this whole time of Jacob's trouble, all these things are very confusing. And a lot of people, when they're hard to understand, they'll twist it to their own destruction. And you see, it's different than just having a I mean, it's very different than just having some kind of varied eschatology. It's really about people coming and say, well, you missed the day of the Lord altogether. And you can see where that would unsettle people to a level that's just different than us saying you're on mill, pre mill, post mill, you know, whatever it might be. Second Thessalonians chapter two, he says, uh, or continuing this passage, I guess, verse number five. I'm sorry, I forgot I had more here. Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? He told them, he wrote them. He says, and you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed at, at in his time. Well, again, that's hard to understand. Are we talking about the church here? Which, of course, I would affirm that we do, if you know my theology. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he's taken out of the way. Well, I think the Spirit of God will take away the church, and that church will then uh, be the perfect, the absence of that church, the vacuum of that church will be the perfect context in which this lawless thing that is talked about with this man at the top of that pyramid will be revealed. Anyway, those things are hard to understand. That's why we show a lot of grace as Christians in the varying eschatologies that we might have about the end times. And yet we know that people can take this to a place, twisting it to a place that leads to them becoming false teachers. And this is not the nuances of eschatology. This has to do with the issues of eternal life and heaven and hell and the doctrines of God and the doctrines of salvation. And so we understand that clearly through the fact that some of these things are hard, as it says here, to understand. And I think back to why there might have been confusion. Speaking of the gathering together, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, the euphemism for death, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring him will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And this, for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive and are left until the coming of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15 spoke of this, not all shall sleep, right? Not everyone's gonna die, but we're all gonna be changed. Well, in a twinkling of an eye, in a moment, the last trumpet, they're gonna be completely transformed. Well, what is that? Well, this is the kind of difficult eschatology that we don't have a tome written for us, this big catalog of things. We have these snippets of information through the revelation of God and then an entire book that was yet to come, the book of Revelation and the end of the last decade of the first century where there was a lot of mystery involved in that, a lot of apocalyptic visions and symbols and imagery that is difficult to get through. And so this applies even to words yet to come. He says, anyway, we're not gonna proceed those who have fallen asleep for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And you know the rest of this, we who are alive and are left will be caught up, there's our word, harpazo, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I thought he was coming back to the earth. I thought we we're gonna meet him here on the earth as he comes to get us. Well, there's a lot of teaching about that. And that's why we talk about a taking up of the church, the beginning of this time of Jacob's trouble, and then a return at the end where he comes not to meet the people in the air and take them back, but coming back to the Mount of Olives. And then during this whole period of time, the Philipsis, the Greek text about pressing, God's wrath is going to press down on this world. So he's coming to get his church, he's coming in judgment, and he's coming here to deliver Israel before the millennial kingdom. At least that's my eschatology as I understand the, both the Old and New Testament promises. Nevertheless, this is all on par with the other scriptures. And we've talked about this a lot. We don't need to get into detail about it. You know it, but it talks about the fact that all scripture, there's our word, ta grafe, the, the word grafe, same word here, the writings, they're breathed out by God. Well, he says the other scriptures or the rest of scriptures. So we're speaking here of the letters of Paul being on par with scripture. Now that's important. We recognize that that is what we see in the Bible regarding the apostles' writings. 
And remember here in 2 Peter chapter 3, the context here started with the fact that we are to remember the predictions, verse 2, of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So these are the things that have the authority of the Lord. They come through the apostles, which of course is only a fulfillment as we saw, and I listed this earlier in our series in John chapter 16, that the point of the Spirit coming to these apostles and one untimely born named Paul, he will guide them into all truth. They will not speak on their own authority, and he will rather not. The Spirit will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And of course, he's going to speak through these apostles, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. And that is what we're dealing with in 2 Peter chapter 3. And how do we know that this is the case? Well, because the Holy Spirit is at work affirming the truth of the Scriptures. As it says here in Hebrews chapter 2, just to jump into the end of it, it's declared. All this salvation that is discussed is declared by the Lord. It was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witnesses by signs and wonders and various miracles by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Well, that was the thing that was done to authenticate the fact that this message of salvation, both present and future, has come from God and it was attested to by uh, miracles and signs and wonders to those who directly heard it. As we saw yesterday in that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that Paul here now is claiming to have that wisdom from God, that the Spirit revealed that to him. And not only that, but as it says in Hebrews chapter 2, we have Paul saying, and you've seen those signs through me, those miraculous creative miracles. 2 Corinthians 12, 12, the reason we know his writings and his ministry had the authority of the Lord Jesus is because, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, he says the signs of the true of a true apostle, a lot of fake apostles, chapter um, 12, verse 11 speaks of that, the phony apostles, he sarcastically called them the super apostles. He says, but the true apostles, you saw the things that you didn't see with them. The signs were done, were performed among you with the utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. These are the things that Paul calls their attention to having done in their presence and they saw them which reminds us of the authority of his writings and this is a good statement regarding the fact that the letters of the apostle paul along with the other works of the apostles authenticated by signs and wonders have the weight of tograph the scriptures that are god breathed and those there's a lot more we could do talking about new testament authority uh, here is at least a primer on it that reminds us of the power and the authority of the passages that we read in the new testament and study every single day including our passage here in second peter so more on this tomorrow thanks for listening we're getting to the end two more to go we'll see you through friday